so COVID has kind of thrown the entire world into a tailspin, I guess. I know baseball players can be creatures of habit and you like to do certain things in certain times. Um, can you kind of speak to how COVID protocols have affected you guys, everything from your pregame routines to travel to uh, you know interactions in the clubhouse and around the field? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, COVID has been so weird amongst sports in general. And, and baseball speaking, I think our team kind of experienced it probably the worst with, you know, not being able to play in Toronto at all. And, you know, we spent two weeks in, in second spring training summer camp up in Toronto. And at the end of it, they were like, sorry, you guys can't play here. And we were immediately trying to find somewhere else to play. And the season had already started. It was already a week into the season and we still didn't have a place. And we eventually found Buffalo being a place where we can make major league ready. And, you know, the staff up there with, uh, with the Blue Jays, you know, they, they work so hard to be able to do that for us. And um, we're extremely grateful for it. And, and so just being in a AAA stadium as our home field just in general was uh, a little bit crazy. And um, we were pretty much in a bubble in, in a hotel in Buffalo where we were just the only thing that we were doing outside of the stadium and, and hotel was pretty much just walking to the field. And uh, that was definitely a little weird, not being, being able to do anything or even really interacting with our teammates outside of the work that the staff did at Buffalo, where they were able to socially distance the lockers, um, to stuff in the weight room, training room, it was a little bit different being in that type of environment versus being closer together. Um, we were able to work around it. Me individually, I was able to do my same routine, my same cage work and, and eating uh, schedule. And, um, you know, we, we just pretty much just made it work and, we were able to have some success at it and get into the playoffs. So uh, it was a crazy year, but it was um, it was successful, and uh, I had, we had a lot of fun doing it. How weird was it to know that you're playing a game and for the stands to be virtually empty? I mean, do you guys feed off of fans during, uh, you know, the norm, a normal game where there's, where there's fans in the crowd and there's all this action and things happening? You feed off of that, and then how weird was it for that to just all of a sudden – be completely gone. Yeah, it was um, it was pretty crazy. But I'd say probably in the beginning of the year, probably the first two weeks, where you know we were just happy to be out there playing because we for a while there we didn't really think we were going to have a season there. And uh, I think initially the excitement and the energy from both dugouts were, you know, we didn't even think okay, like, whatever. Like, we noticed there's no fans, but you know the intensity is still here, the electricity is still somewhat here, and you know, kind of got a month into it and kind of throughout, it was just like, you know, there was obviously, you know, just the fans not being there. And, uh, you know, when there's fans in the, in, in the stands and you obviously feed off that home or away, it, it, it definitely brings a little, a lot more energy and electricity into, you know, our own dugouts and whatnot. But, um, you know, I, I think it was, it was interesting where we had to really put our head down and be like, okay, we still have a job to do, um, you know, maybe hard to get up for this game and no one in the stands at, you know, one o'clock game here in Buffalo. Um, but, uh, you know, our, our team and our clubhouse is so good it's, and we're so tight and we have so much fun playing the game and, uh, you know, we were able to make kind of a, a funky situation um, and turn it into something fun and, and some a season that we obviously will never forget. Yeah, that's a, a crazy year. I don't, I can't imagine doing, uh, having to, play, do what you do in front of empty stadiums when you're used to them being just filled. If there was one thing about being a major league baseball player that you could tell those of us who are not, that we don't understand, like what's one thing you wish the general public knew about being a professional baseball player? First off, I would, I would say it's the best job in the world. And it's, I mean, you get to do something that you've been doing your whole life. And it's been, you know, pretty much everyone's dream to be doing this. And, you know, you work so hard to get there and then to stay there is, is even harder. So that all culminates into the dream finding a destination. And, and it, it's so cool. But I think people and fans should realize that it is, it's a long road to get to the big leagues. And, you know, a lot of people think, you know, oh, you're well off, you're in the big leagues, like whatever. But, you know, 
I know some people didn't play in the minor leagues for that long. You know, all the great players, you know, were too good for it. But, you know, there's a lot of players that spent almost a decade in the minor leagues just grinding, not getting paid really anything, bus rides everywhere where, you know, I've had bus rides up to 18 hours just to go play an A-ball game in front of 500 people. And, and I think that gets lost on, on some, um, on the average fan, but, uh, it's a, it's a long destination and when you get there and when you've been through the process of the minor leagues through college, high school, whatever, where people came from, it, it just, um, it makes it that much more special and, um, you know, motivates us every single day to, to stay there and to get better and, and to be the best possible players that we can be. Those, those minor league experiences where you talk about riding 18 hours on a bus, um, in my mind, uh, my mind goes to like Bull Durham. Right, like the bus ride scenes in Bull Durham. Does does experiencing that does it deepen your love or your passion for the game and really make you appreciate everything you've gone through once you get to your level in the big leagues and you're getting paid to play the game that you love? One hundred percent. I mean, I think going through those long bus rides, going through you know playing in not so great fields and maybe in front of nobody in, in blazing heat and it's or even the opposite freezing cold and um, i think it matures you as a baseball player it makes you stronger as a baseball player and a person you know those bus those bus rides where you know you, even in the beginning when you're getting on a bus full of guys who you barely even know who's from all over the world speaking different languages it's it, and you learn how to communicate. You learn how to build these friendships. And, you know, I, I've made friendships in the minor leagues with guys that, you know, they're not playing anymore. And, and you know, we're only friends in my life just based off the experiences that we went through together. And, you know, we talked about Bo and Vlad. I mean, we, we hit from high A, double A, triple A to the big leagues. We, we, we hit every level together and, and, I think our our chemistry with with guys who were with us as well is is a lot stronger because of those uh, experiences. I I don't want to get into the political the unioning aspect of of minor leagues, but you talked about being with kind of maturing with Bo and with Vlad, and it's got to be great to see other guys succeed along with you. But I'm I'm interested in kind of the emotions that you go through when there is somebody say, a single A or rookie ball or at any minor league step along the way that never quite makes somebody that you're close with that you develop a friendship with that doesn't ever get to the pros. Like, how difficult is that to watch somebody, you know, get a very, 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 like, small taste of what professional baseball is like without ever actually reaching the pinnacle? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I played with so many players that have – way more talent than I do that, that don't make it. And, and that happens more often than not. And I think it's something that we have to remind ourselves is that we're on, we're in the very one percentile of people who get to play this game at the highest level that are playing it or, or started playing it and, and, and they couldn't make it. But yeah, I've played with a number of guys where, you know, certainly they deserved it, but to get to the big leagues, there's a lot of people that, deserve it there's a lot of players in my leagues that deserve it but to get there is extremely difficult and you need a lot of luck where you know not really there's not always the opportunity in the big leagues that presents it to a player and they're just kind of stuck in the minor leagues and and it, it, it sucks but you know we all go through it and you know i think the hardest thing is especially when you get to triple a and you're a step away and you, you you can smell the big leagues and you know i, I found it a little challenging to focus, you know, okay, I still got to play my game. I still got to get better, but you know, you're ready for the big leagues and you know, you've proved yourself and now you're just waiting for, for an opportunity to, to come up. And, um, you know, I think some guys, they fall into the hole of, of looking for that opportunity and lose focus on really just trying to get better every day and, and trying to win that night. And it's just, um, it's a crazy game. It's a crazy process. And it's just, you got to have uh, a little bit of luck to, to get, a, get a taste of it. Yeah, I've always yeah. thought that that's, that's got to be difficult to watch one of your buddies get so close and to never actually make it. It's almost like you would feel bad for them. On the flip side, once you got to Toronto, 
Was there um, a veteran or two that kind of took you under their wing, almost like became a mentor for you to kind of walk you through? This is what it's like. You know, you always hear people, the cliches, you know, carry yourself a certain way, you know, do the right things, play the game right, respect the game. Was there somebody that kind of helped you along and helped you learn how to conduct yourself as a major league player? Yeah, probably a couple of names that jump out. A guy like Justin Smoke, who, you know, he was there for, for a while. And Freddie got this, you know, he's got you know, almost 10 years in the big leagues. And But I think um, number one guy is probably Eric Sogard. You know, going into that spring training was my first big league camp. And he was on a minor league deal trying to make the team as well. And from day one in spring training, I, I, he was – helping me any way possible when we're both second base and we're both fighting for the, for the same job. And you no, know, I, I was asking him questions about little things like, Hey, like what time should I show up? Or do you think it'd look bad if I did this or that? And he was always there to answer my questions. And, you know, neither of us made the big league team out of spring training. We both actually went to Buffalo and, you know, same thing there. I was just learning from him. I was like, what do you do here? What do you do that? And then it gets to the big leagues and meet him there. He was always there to answer my questions and to listen to me and to give me pointers. And that's so big to a, to a young guy where, you know, you know, they want to do well, they want to make an impression and you want to make it seem like, you know, everything, you know, how it's supposed to look like, but when you get to the big leagues, no one really knows until you experience it or you see it. And he was a guy that was always there for me to, to learn and, to do the things the way they're supposed to be doing. And for him to be doing that as a, as a second baseman or another infielder kind of speaks to the fact that he's a stand-up guy. Is there, was there any second guessing when, like, did you go to him? Did he come to you? I mean, w- was there any type of, oh man, like, is this guy legit? Or is he maybe trying, you know what I'm saying? Is he trying to derail me? Or or did you just trust that he was, because I know he's well-traveled. He's been, he's been on a lot of teams and he's, 10, 10 years or more, was there any any of that hesitation or did you just just gravitate towards him? And he's a very authentic guy, so it, it was real. You could tell it was real. Yeah, no. Yeah, 100%. He was having a guy like that who's been around the game and who's in a similar situation where they're trying to make the team and they're, they're trying to get back to the big leagues and, and you know, of, um, you know, make another impact and show – that, hey, I shouldn't be in the minor league. I should be an everyday big leaguer. And for him, I mean, I think he saw the writing on the wall where I was going to be there past that year and, and he was going to be a free agent after that. And he he came to me sometimes. I came to him more often than not. You know, he he wanted what was best for me. And I think in the game of baseball, the number one compliment you can get is being a good teammate. And it's so much easier said than done. It's such a long year and you're going to get to know everybody through their ups and their downs. But if you can maintain being a good teammate, you have everybody to respect. And Sogard was a guy who, you know, through his struggles and his ups, he was the same guy in the locker room. He was the same guy to me. And he was the ultimate teammate. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't thank him enough or, or ask for a better guy to uh, come into the big leagues with. So a, a veteran like that at your position, I'm curious about defensive shifts. Is that something, I know he, he played in the big leagues before most teams did them. And of course he's playing now and everybody's doing them like crazy now. Is that something that you would go to him and, and kind of feel out? Because I know sometimes the second baseman's way out in right field. Sometimes he's, you know, behind second base. It, depending on the team you play for, they have the alignment differently. Is that is that the type of thing where you would actually go to him for like a technical, how do I do this type of thing? Yeah, 100 percent And I think Freddie Galvis helped me out a lot with that as well. And in the minor leagues, I mean, there's not as much information on guys analytically than there, than there are on guys in the big league. So shifts were kind of thing in the minor leagues, but nothing like it is in the big leagues. It you know, I, I got called up and pretty much had a meeting with the infield coach, like, hey, we do this and this and this, you're gonna be lined up here, and if this happens, you're gonna go there. And that's kind of um pretty brand new to me. And, you know, a lot of help came from on field with, with Freddie and shortstop being like, like, hey, the ball hit over here. I'll be there. I'll be okay. And then I, I slowly started to learn it and learn it. And 
you know, after a lot of experience, you, you get the hang of it. But shifts were definitely, especially the middle infielder, like with the runners on, who's covering the bag and, and where you're supposed to go for balls hit wherever down the line and cuts and relays. It's all pretty confusing unless you you have a guy who's been around, who's done it and understands it and can kind of walk you through it on field versus, you know, before and the uh, and then it happens and everything moves so fast. And to be to be poised in a situation like that is is the most important where you don't panic and you kind of know where you're going. And having a guy like Freddie on the field with me was uh, it was a, a lot of help where, um, you know, kind of feeling it out and eventually getting the hang of it. How much when you're caught out of position? Um, I'll be honest, I've not watched every single Blue Jays game that you've ever been in. I'm sure you've been out of position and it, it's it's allowed a hit or, you know, maybe turning a double play, you, you fumble the ball, bobble the ball or something. What, how much responsibility do you feel to apologize to your teammates for making mistakes like that? Like, and is it something that you actually visible, uh, verbally apologize to them for doing something that could potentially cost the team, um, you know, a run which could cost the team a game? Yeah, it, it, that's, um, it's something where when you make a mistake or just even make an error and you just feel like, I feel, me personally, I feel like I let the pitcher down. And that is kind of like my motivator as a defender where any given situation, if I was the pitcher right there, I would want to go 100%, no matter the game situation, the score, or whatever. It's his ERA, it's his runs, it's it's his, his hits given, given, given up. And that's just kind of the way baseball is, is where you make an error, there's nothing to be said. He knows that you know that you messed up. I'm not, he's not going to be mad at me for it. You know, I didn't give my full effort, but if he knows that I'm giving him my full effort and I, and I mess up and I botch a ball or, or I throw the wrong base or whatever, he knows that I did it 100% and he doesn't care. As long as you, know, you give it all and you're not being lazy on something, it's not really going to bother anybody. You know, I, I think that's the biggest thing is feeling your position behind that pitcher and sh- giving him the respect of, Given you're all every single pitch because it's his livelihood and his career, not only just the game in general. I would like you to speak for a few minutes about and you talk about it being a job and your livelihood, and it's very much the case. Does is the game different now that it's how you make your living versus when you were in little league and even high school where it was you were playing and it was fun and probably even some in college where it was it was still a, a very fun thing for you. Is it different now that it's how you support yourself? It's not for me. And I think when it becomes like that is when the, the game becomes so much more difficult and you put so much more pressure on yourself and you can be out of the game like that. And I think that's the biggest thing is we constantly remind ourselves it's, it's the game. It's something we've been doing our whole life. It's supposed to be fun. And Things like that. If you forget those things, it, it just you put so much pressure on yourself, and that's that's not fun. I mean, to live and die with an at bat, or it's like, oh, don't mess up this ground ball. Like you could get sent down, or you could get released, or whatever. And that's a very difficult way to play the game. And the more we remind ourselves, this is you know we're having fun. We play to win. And that's number. If you play to win, then the rest of it comes into play. You won't be having selfish at bats. You won't be getting mad if you're getting if you're getting out and, and and you just want to cheer on your teammates to to get the win. I mean, don't get me wrong, we get upset when we get out. That's just kind of the competitive factor. But um but yeah, I think number one thing play to win and everything falls into line and then uh, putting pressure on yourself and and whatnot. So uh the game's supposed to be fun and we need to make it as fun as it as it is. That's well said. I like that. Um so I mentioned earlier, uh, math and statistics is kind of um, how I stay in the game. So this is more of a, a personal question for me. How much, if at all, do major league players care about statistics? Your batting average, your home runs, your RBIs as a pitcher, your ERA, your strikeouts, your wins. Does that matter to you guys? And if so, how much and why? So it, it absolutely does matter. It, it's how you're judged. It's how you keep your job. It, it, it's all that stuff. But this kind of leads me back to my last answer is, is if you're playing for your batting average, you're hitting for your batting average, it, it's a it's a very tough game to play. 
Mm-hmm. And if you okay, you're hitting two sixty feet, and you're okay, well, I need to get back up to two seventy. You can get out. Now you're you're two sixty six. Like, oh crap. Now I need to get I definitely need to get a hit if I need to get two seventy. Now you get out again. Now you're two sixty four and I can just keep dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. But if you can take one at bat at a time, one pitch at a time and just slow the game down. And like I said, last answer, I know I'm repeating myself a lot, it's have fun with it, then you don't even look up at the scoreboard. You don't even look to see where your home runs are at, where your RBIs are at, or, or batting average. It's a very dangerous game. And it, analytically wise, there's so much, there's so much information out there, more than the average knows. And I think it ranges from different players where you can use as much as you want, or you can use absolutely nothing. And I think more often than not, people use just a tiny bit of what they need. And that's kind of where I'm at with it as well, where, you know, I don't want, want to overthink it. You know, this game's hard enough as it is. I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. So, you know, I use what I need and everything else could just, uh, could just confuse me, honestly. But um, there's a lot of stuff out there and it's a lot of good stuff. So guys just take what they need. Along the same lines, it's kind of a statistical question, um, but I'm going to put what I hope is a fun spin on it. So it took your dad 15 years to hit for the cycle. You hit for the cycle in about three, three and a half months into your major league career. Do you? Does that give you bragging rights over a Hall of Famer? Maybe at Thanksgiving dinner, you can bring that up or something. I mean, is that is that awesome to be able to say and kind of rub in your dad's face a little bit? Little things like that, yeah, because I, I need to take what I can get since he, he's one of the best to ever play. He's got a million hits, he's got a million doubles, home runs, whatever. So right now, it's pretty much the only thing that I can stay so I can take what I can get. In the off season, what is it that you specifically do to kind of unwind from that 300 or 162 game grind, hopefully more because you're in the class? But what is it that you do to kind of walk away from the game, even if it's just for a few days or a week, to kind of reset yourself? Yeah, so after the season, I mean, like you said, 162 games is a lot of games, and your body is – is crushed. I mean, you, you go into spring training, you're strong, and you, your body pretty much gets constantly beat up until the last game of the season. And for me, I I take off baseball things such as throwing and ground balls, hitting. I take off until December, early December, maybe late November. I'll start hitting or maybe playing a little bit of catch. So I think it's really important to get away from the game, you know, get away from, you know, trying to analyze your swing. Um, giving your arm a break before every day, it's a lot of strain on your arm and, and recovery is, is huge when it comes to, to your arm and whatnot. So giving your arm a break, giving your, your body a break from swinging is, uh, you know, I, I think is really important. And then especially if, if I want to make some adjustments in my swing, it, it kind of gets rid of some old habits and lets me start as, as a new foundation and try to build up from there. And, uh, so mainly it's just from the get-go is just strength training and, and working on maybe some agilities. Rebuilding that body to get it ready for the next year. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, if there was if there was one piece of advice that you could give to, you know, a little leaguer, maybe there's a 12, 13-year-old guy that wants to, who thinks he wants to play professional baseball, what, what would you tell him? If you could only give him one piece of advice, what would that be? I'd probably say a couple things. Number one, have fun, like I always say. But uh, number two, watch the game. And that is so much easier said than done. Um, you know, when you're not playing, staying focused on every single pitch. And even if you're not playing, maybe you go to a big league game or you're watching a game on TV, it's a little bit more difficult. But you just watch the game, watch the players, even if, you know, say you're a shortstop. Watch the shortstop before the play. Watch the shortstop after the play. Watch them communicate. See what they're doing, and just kind of understand that that's what they're doing at the highest level. And maybe you can take a little bit out and put it into your game and try things out on your own team. And even as a youngster, it's just I think watching the game is is so undervalued because I mean, when I was a kid, I, I that was my favorite thing to do was to watch the game, whether it was at Minute Maid Park or was it if it was on TV? So um, I think that's where I had a, a pretty good benefit 
an advantage where I was able to watch the game as much as I was and, and be able to, to go behind the scenes and meet players and whatnot. But, um, you know, I say as a young kid, definitely watch the game, watch the players, watch your position and, and maybe you can take something from it.